I am so thankful that Gillian Anderson is in this show. Not only is she amazing in it, I probably would never have watched it if she wasn't. And for that, I am grateful. Hi all, my name is Ryan and welcome to my channel What The Pop, where we discuss pop culture in general, Buffy a lot, and a few things queer. Now I was a massive X-Files fan growing up, and while most people loved David Duchovny's Fox Mulder, I was all about Gillian Anderson's Dana Scully. So when season one of Sex Education dropped on Netflix, I watched it almost immediately, simply because Gillian Anderson was in it. And I'm so glad she was, because Sex Education is an amazing show. Probably my favourite thing about Sex Education is that although it is a comedy, the comedy doesn't punch down. It isn't usually derived from making fun of differences. It's mostly derived from the fact that life and the interactions we have are just inherently funny. So like most people with a Netflix subscription, I binged watched season 3 of Sex Education as soon as it dropped. And while story-wise, story I don't think it's quite as strong as the previous two seasons. It's still strong, though. Representation-wise, it was outstanding. For a show that has been lauded for its representation since the first season premiered, increasing that representation and diversity in seasons two and three without it losing the quality of story and characters has been a blueprint for other shows to follow. While Sex Education is praised for its LGBTQ... Representation, it is a show that nails representation across the board. And with the introduction of non-binary character Cal, this show has one of the most diverse group of characters on any show ever. A racially and ethnically diverse cast with a diverse array of sexual identities, a diverse range of sexual interests, gender diversity and disabilities and experiences, and this show is much better for it. Everyone is flawed, everyone is unique, and most importantly, Everyone engages with sex in a different way. People who have always had representation don't often understand what a big deal representation is. It is hard growing up and not seeing yourself represented on television or in movies or in other forms of pop culture such as comics. Even worse is if the only depictions of you are always negative. I didn't see a gay man on television who wasn't a super camp stereotype played to elicit laughs until I was 15. The only gay man I can recall, of course I never called him gay, was Mr. Humphreys from the British sitcom Are You Being Served? And well, he fit the super camp gay stereotype. Can you take over from me? I'm afraid not, Captain Peacock. I'm right in the middle of demonstrating the magic mushroom tree. <laughs> I'll take over. <laughs> At 15, though, in 1992 is when Melrose Place came out, and one of the first openly gay male characters on television, Matt Fielding, played by Doug Savant, was debuted. Now, admittedly, I was already watching Melrose Place when it was revealed that Matt was gay. As many teenagers were, I was a big fan of Beverly Hills 90210, and followed the Melrose Place spin-off. But as soon as it was revealed that Matt was gay, Melrose Place became must-watch television for me. And although I had very little in common with the character, it was the only representation of someone gay that I had at the time. It wasn't until four years later in 1996 that I got my second lot of representation, and one that was far more like me. It was Heath Ledger's first role, playing Snowy Bowles in the Australian series Sweat. Sweat was based in the West Coast Sports Academy, a fictional school for the athletically gifted. Heath Ledger's character Snowy was a teenage cyclist who came out during the 26th episode run of the show. Look. People start asking questions. Excuse me if I'm a bit confused here, mate, but what are these questions you're so worried about? Look, the thing is, Dan, I might be gay. No. I know I am. As someone who is also athletically inclined and gay, I immediately related to him and the struggles he was going through. I got similar representation with Kerr Smith's character Jack McPhee, also a gay athlete in Dawson's Creek. And of course, it was Dawson's Creek that showed the first male-on-male -male kiss on network television in the US. Yeah, I want to show you that I can and that I'm not afraid to... Well, 
this. I should point out for LGBTQ history buffs that Australia had shown these things long before. There was a show in the 70s called Number 96 that had an openly gay character, depicted a gay kiss, and had a trans character played by someone who is actually trans in the 70s. Of course, that sexual revolution died in the 70s as Australia slid into social conservatism, something we are still pushing against but have yet to escape. Now sadly, by the time Jack McPhee appeared, I was no longer a teenager. I still watched it, the representation still mattered to me, and I still craved that representation. But it was representation I needed while I was growing up, to know that the feelings I had about other boys were okay and normal, and nothing to be ashamed of. I needed that, I didn't get it, and it messed me up in ways I can't articulate. When you don't see yourself represented, or you continually see yourself represented as the butt of jokes, or just generally in a negative light, it affects your mental health over time. Because a lack of representation tells you that you don't matter, and that you have no place in society. A little while ago, I was watching High School Musical, the musical, the series, and there was an episode where two openly gay characters are in a relationship together, and one throws the other a massive party serenades him in front of their friends and they kissed, all cheered on by their friends. And it made me deliriously happy that these shows now exist. Shows like Love Victor, Elite and Young Royals and of course Sex Education that have gay male characters front and centre. This is the sort of representation that I needed when I was a teenager and I'm so happy that gay teens today have it. When you have no actual representation in media when growing up, or even when grown up, you look for the next best thing. Looking for pseudo-representation is how you get queer readings of things that aren't necessarily supposed to be read as queer. And sometimes all you find is allegory. My pseudo-representation growing up was the X-Men. I wrote this in 2018 when Stan Lee died. As a gay teen in the 90s, there was very little representation for us in mainstream media. We were still very much outcasts and reviled by many. This man, Stan Lee, created an entire universe and an entire franchise in the X-Men where I found validation. Feared and hated by most, their struggle for love, acceptance and mutant rights was my struggle. The legacy virus that targeted only mutants was analog analogous to the HIV AIDS epidemic, initially seen as a gay disease. Their battles, their wins and losses, their deaths, their joys, they became my own. Most importantly, they let me know that I wasn't broken and I didn't need fixing, that I was fine the way I was. Thank you, Stan Lee. Your universe was my beacon and probably saved my life. Excelsior. That's how important representation is, even indirect, allegorical representation. So I am a massive advocate for increasing diversity and representation in media because I understand exactly how harmful it is when you don't have it. Now, representation often presents as pandering to an audience, a need to fill a diversity quota that usually results in underwritten characters that are stereotypes or genre tropes. They often lack any depth to their character other than what makes them diverse. And this is where sex education shines the most. While other shows still debate these issues, discussing them as right or wrong, talking morality and religion, on sex education, that diversity reflected everywhere in characters and experiences is the absolute norm. And what sex education does so well is that it doesn't debate these issues. It simply acknowledges them and addresses them. Masturbation, both male and female, yep. Penis sizes and, and differences in vaginas, covered. Abortion, absolutely. Asexuality, it's there. Being able to orgasm, that's in there too. Dealing with sexual assault, faith and spiritu spirituality, the everyday issues faced by people who are non-binary or trans. These things are all just taken as matter of fact and discussed with nuance and intelligence. And it is so refreshing, because it means the show doesn't have to spend time on tired and cliched story points and just delve straight into creating characters that have actual depth and are interesting and unique as a result. Although ostensibly the very white and heterosexual Otis and Maeve are our main characters, being the brains behind the sex clinic, I'd argue that Eric, our flamboyantly gay religious black boy of Nigerian descent, damn he covers a lot of diversity points, is every bit the co-lead that Otis and Maeve are. 
Eric is one of my favourite characters on television at the moment, and he reminds me so much of rapper Little Nas X. They are both unapologetically gay in a heterosexual world. They refuse to make themselves smaller and are just unafraid to occupy space and simply be who they are. And they don't care what you think of them, and I am here for it. Outside of the main three, all the other characters are fleshed out. There are very few named characters that aren't explored, providing a number of interesting and unique people of various races, sexualities, experiences and motivations. And they create a cornucopia of interesting and unique stories unlike anything else on television. Adam, who has developed from emotionally stunted high school bully into a young man learning to articulate his feelings and what he wants. Uh, a classic line in this season is when he wants to have sex with Eric, but struggles to say exactly what it is he wants, until he eventually just tells Eric that he wants Eric to put his dick in his bum, and says it as straight out as that. He's also learning to find what he is good at, and is encouraged to pursue it by his teacher. Now while he hasn't declared exactly what he is, let's face it, Adam says very little, he is at least at the moment somewhat bisexual. Now, we may learn in the future that him sleeping with girls was a phase, and that he's now gay. But I hope they don't go down that route. For bi visibility and representation, I would actually prefer his character be bisexual. There is no requirement in the story to erase his girl phase, so I hope at some point he does articulate that he's still attracted to girls. And with a show who is so good at representation, it would go a long way to stop a history of bi erasure. In season 3, Jackson is now finding himself attracted to non-binary character Cal, and they have a very frank discussion about the fact that a relationship between them would mean that Jackson would be in a queer relationship. And Cal eventually says the two of them are better off as friends, because Jackson, on some level, still sees Cal as a girl. And Jackson admits to that. In a very frank and honest talk about a subject that you never see on television, and it never comes across as judgmental or preachy, it's just their situation and they're dealing with it. But I'll talk more about Cal shortly. Amy is working through her problems with her sexual assault, as it is interfering with her relationship. When she is talking about smiling at this guy, and whether she invited him to assault her, Gillian Anderson's character, Jean Milburn, says something so simple that I found quite profound for victims who blame themselves for what happens to them. Basically, she says something along the lines of, you've smiled at other men before and they haven't assaulted you. I've never heard it framed that way, and it was just another of those things that made me realise how intelligent this show is along with the comedy. The thing I like most about Amy's storyline is that it isn't the usual storyline for sexual assault. She wasn't raped, she wasn't drunk at a party, or... She didn't go down a dark alley alone. She wasn't sexually assaulted while wearing a mini skirt. She was simply on her way to school. And I think it's so important for the show to depict a physically non-violent act of sexual assault and still see the emotional trauma that can result from that. Because a lot of non-violent acts of sexual assault simply get dismissed because there's no physical trauma. We see things developing uh, between Maeve and Isaac. Isaac is a paraplegic, but with encouragement from his brother, finally tells Maeve how he feels about her. They start getting intimate and exchange a kiss and they have a detailed discussion on disability and sex. And it was so well done because it wasn't an information dump. It wasn't someone reeling off a list of do's and don'ts. It was an open and touching discussion between two characters about their needs in a moment of intimacy. Seeing a disabled character as a sexual being is something you don't see on television. While the show has been leaps and bounds ahead of its contemporaries in, term of, in terms of representation, new character Cal for season 3 is where the show takes steps to address people who are MB, non-binary. Now this could have come across as preachy, but the writers approach Cal's character and story moments with the same level of nuance and intelligence that they have all other topics so far. And this applies to minor character Layla as well, who is also MB. The rebranding and restructuring of Moordale to try and shake off the sex school image being discussed in the media uh, through Jean Milburn's book introduces a number of policies that create conflict for students that are non-binary. One of the biggest changes for the school is the introduction of school uniforms. 
and essentially what equates to uh, appearance policies about hair, etc. This, is, has, this has some significant effects on the students. First, in a show that is largely about celebrating the richness of diversity that its characters represent, this change starts to strip them of their individuality and self-expression, something that hits alien-loving Lily rather hard. But further than that, by stripping out that diversity, it creates a binary, a situation where students are forced to conform to policies that are either male or female-centric. When it comes to the extremely backward sex education that the characters receive, which have been segregated based on sex, Cal questions what line they and Layla belong in. A new principal, Hope, says the female one, as Cal calls it, the penis and vagina lines, reflecting that binary. This binary extends to the uniforms, and Cal chooses to wear the male uniform and also chooses one that is baggy and oversized, a choice made that reflects Cal's relationship with their body. This choice clashes with the policy, and while Hope allows the choice of the male uniform, she insists Cal wears one that fits properly, something they are uncomfortable doing. With the destruction of the old toilets where the sex clinic was being held, it is revealed that many of the queer and trans students used it to change because they weren't comfortable or didn't feel safe changing in the locker rooms with everyone else. So when Cal has to change in the normal locker rooms, uh, there are comments made about their weird crop top, which is a binder. Binders come up again later when Layla asks Cal for help with them. Um, and like many of the other issues in this show, it assumes that the audience is smart enough to know what one is and what it's for, and if they don't, to look it up, because it doesn't handhold through the conversation and explain why it's necessary or what it's for, and it just depicts how binders are simply a part of their life. And so much of Cal's story comes back to their relationship with their body and what they're willing to share with others, and baggy clothes mask a body that Cal isn't comfortable with. Like many facades that queer kids go through, such as pretending to be straight or into things expected of heteronormativity, the choice is one of feeling safe. But even in that space, Cal isn't ever ashamed. Shame is often a part of the queer experience because of mostly religious pressures and often forms a part of queer stories. But I love Cal's line, I buy my chest and I feel no shame, because it's a wonderful moment of affirmation. One of my favourite things in this season is Cal's refusal to teach Jackson about what it means to be with someone who is non-binary. The burden of explanation and instruction is so often placed onto minorities to define and teach others about themselves and the issues they face, which is an ongoing life stress when you have to do it over and over again with each new person. By virtue of that, it seems like an ongoing need to justify their existence something they shouldn't have to do at all. So when Cal said to Jackson, there's so much shit I don't know about myself yet, I can't carry you too, I applauded. Most importantly, with this show, none of these characters' stories feel like they are being wedged into the show. All of it feels like a natural progression of their character. And by taking time to develop characters and give time for their stories to breathe, it doesn't feel like the audience is being preached at. This show could have easily fallen into a topic by episode formula, where they cover non-binary in one episode, asexuality in another, sexual assault in the next, etc. Where they introduce a character, introduce the topic, and then have it resolved by the end. But by having characters with depth, treating issues with intelligence, and assuming their audience aren't idiots, the show manages to cover issues and teach more about sex education so far in these three seasons than most teenagers would ever get from school. And it does it without ever making it a clinical lesson. Now I mentioned in my analysis of Young Royals how it created characters that seem real and authentic. And while I don't think that sex education quite does that, it is a comedy after all, so characters are somewhat exaggerated, they do share something in common creating characters that are relatable. And with a cast as diverse as this, there is someone relatable for almost everyone. Thanks for watching. If you like what I do, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to be notified whenever I upload a new video. Or consider supporting the channel through our Patreon. If you think I missed anything or have any comments, put them in the comments below, and I'll see you next video.